Good morning, everybody. I'm so excited to be with you today. Um, let's dive right into it. I have a lot to cover with you today on the dual diagnosis of Down syndrome and autism. My only disclosure is that I have received a grant from Braco Diagnostics. This is unrelated to anything I will be discussing in today's talk. I have no other disclosure other than my passion. Um, as a background, until very recently, it was believed that autism was uncommon in people with Down syndrome and that there was no particular association uh, between Down syndrome and autism. This is a textbook from the 90s uh, that still states that they see no particular association uh, between rates of autism and uh, uh, in individuals with Down syndrome, um, as well as other conditions. And in my presentation today, I hope to educate you on the fact that that is incorrect, and we will talk about some background of uh, where this information comes from, the epidemiology of uh, autism in individuals with Down syndrome, how autism presents in this special population, suggestions for assessments and interventions, and lastly, the impact of a diagnosis of autism on the family of someone with Down syndrome. As background, the information I will present today comes from two sources. One is a literature review uh, that was done by Dr. Brian Belden, a PhD, and Dr. Natalie Holtain, a doctorate of psychologist from Mercy Children's in Kansas City. Um, they reviewed uh, a number of articles after uh, performing a PubMed search uh, using keywords Down syndrome and autism. And I reviewed all of these articles as well in preparation for this talk. Some things to know about the literature review is that not all the studies that I will talk about today have a comparison group. Many of these studies have a small sample size and the, therefore while imperfect, they do begin to describe the phenotype of children with Down syndrome and autism while highlighting the need for further research. The graphic at the bottom, uh, this bar graph over here, uh, uh, shows the number of articles on the dual diagnosis of Down syndrome and autism over time. The reassuring news is that we are learning more together um, about this dual diagnosis, and we hope that this trend will continue to improve. The other uh, information that I will present today comes from a research survey that was done um, by myself and a team that I will introduce in a second. It was developed to understand the experiences of families uh, with in, uh, who have children with a dual diagnosis. We asked about the early years prior to diagnosis, uh, interactions with the medical and educational system, perspectives on what interventions and supports were helpful, and reflections on how the dual diagnosis impacted the family unit. This was IRB approved, and uh, um, all survey respondents were members of the Down Syndrome Autism Connection, which is a closed online support group for families who have a child with a confirmed or suspected di dual diagnosis. Uh, the team included myself, uh, Dr. Alyssa Velasco, who will be graduating this year and is a pediatric resident at uh, Children's Hospital Oakland. Uh, uh, Drew Wittekey, uh, a master's in public health at UC Berkeley and currently a medical student at, the, uh, at UC Irvine. And then the amazing Lena Patel, a doctor of psychologist at the University of Colorado Sci Center uh, for uh, Down syndrome. Um, what did we learn? Let's start with epidemiology. How common is autism in children with Down syndrome? From the literature review, we found that, that reports of uh, prevalence range from 4% to 41%. Uh, so this is a very wide variation that is in part due to the fact that different tools are used in different studies to identify autism. And that most, if not all of these tools are not validated specifically for individuals with Down syndrome. Some studies use screening tools while others use diagnostic tests. We're lucky to have a meta-analysis from 2015 that looked at the frequency of autism in a number of genetic conditions. This meta-analysis found that a reported prevalence of autism in individuals uh, with Down syndrome of 16%. This is, of course, much higher than that in the general population, which is 1.7%. And it is an estimate that I'm comfortable with uh, in terms of uh, uh, also thinking about my own patient population at the Down syndrome clinic. Are there any risk factors for having autism? 
this uh, a number of studies noted that the uh, preponderance of their patients with a dual diagnosis were male. Uh, in our parent survey, incidentally, 70% uh, of respondents had uh, children with a dual diagnosis who were male. Um, other smaller studies did not find a specific uh, correlation between gender and uh, risk of autism and Down syndrome. Um, so these findings are suggestive of a male prevalence uh, of autism in children with Down syndrome, uh, which is uh, consistent with that in the general population. Are there any medical conditions that put a child with Down syndrome at higher risk for developing autism? This question is still very much to be answered, and we are working as a, a research, cons research consortium uh, at looking specifically at this. Um, in studies that have been published, uh, we've only found one medical condition that is statistically significantly associated with a higher risk for autism, and that is infantile spasms. Lower IQ seems to be associated with an increased chance of having autism. Is this a chicken or the egg kind of scenario? I don't know. Certainly someone with a dual diagnosis of Down syndrome and autism is gonna be a little harder to test in terms of cognitive ability. And so they may um, uh, test as having lower IQ. Is the lower IQ in itself uh, causative of an increased risk of autism? We uh, certainly don't know this quite yet. However, if you have an individual who's testing at a lower IQ and is exhibiting autistic behaviors, they will certainly warrant further evaluation. And then family history. Is there anything about family history that could increase one's risk of having autism? We have, again, small studies. The one on the left uh, had a comparison group of individuals with Down syndrome only. Uh, the one on the right was a retrospective look at 25 individuals with a dual diagnosis. Both studies found that um, uh, a diagnosis of uh, uh, autism in a child with Down syndrome seemed to be associated with some aspects of family history, such as the presence of autism or autistic traits um, in the uh, family member and communication impairments, as well as uh, other learning disorders. So some take home points in terms of epidemiology. Around 16% of people with Down syndrome have autism, the opposite of uncommon, huh? Um, it is likely more common in males. It may be more likely with some medical comorbidities, especially infantile spasms. It seems to be associated with lower IQs on testing. And you may find a family history of developmental history uh, of developmental issues as you look into family history. How do children with Down syndrome and autism present? We asked our uh, survey participants, at what age did you first notice that your child was a little different from other children with Down syndrome? And then we asked them at what age they were diagnosed with autism. What we found is that families tended to develop concerns around three to three and a half years of age, and that unfortunately they had to wait a really long time to receive a diagnosis uh, with a, a mean age gap between first concern and uh, a diagnosis of four and a half years. This, I don't have to tell you that this is an unacceptably long delay between first concerns and diagnosis. Why the delay? We asked them, and I just want to point out there is a silver lining, and that is that um, when the part of the survey participants uh, um, uh, of younger children, so children who are getting evaluated and diagnosed now, had a smaller age gap between first concern and diagnosis uh, than uh, participants who were answering uh, who have older children and underwent this process of concern and diagnosis many years ago. So we are getting better as a community in recognizing and diagnosing autism, and this is worth calling out. We asked families, who did you report your concerns to? And uh, did they have the knowledge to guide further evaluation? I wanna point your attention to the fact that over half of our respondents brought the, their concerns to an educator or a therapeutic provider. And uh, of uh, those who brought their concerns to an educator or a therapeutic provider, only 20% uh, found that uh, those providers were knowledgeable in the dual diagnosis and knew what steps uh, they should take further. The other thing, which as a primary care pediatrician, I really take to heart, uh, is that half of our participants reported their concerns first to a primary care doctor and found that only 18% of um, 
to them were knowledgeable in guiding them further in terms of next steps and evaluation, while over 80% of a primary care doctor were not knowledgeable. Medical specialists such as neurologists and developmental pediatricians um, did better um, with uh, higher rates of having been found knowledgeable about the dual diagnosis and next steps. So this, there's clearly a great need for further education and awareness about the dual diagnosis, hence why I'm here today. How do kids present? Um, we asked families, um, what were some things you noticed about your child that made you think that they were a little different from other children with Down syndrome? These were free text answers. We then coded the free text answers in terms of specific presentations and behaviors, and we looked at the frequency of the responses. Uh, when we look at these percentages, we're looking at percentages um, uh, of respondents that brought up each specific concern. Uh, this is not to say that other um, children of participants may have had the same concerns and just didn't think to write it down. Um, over half of our respondents brought up stereotypic behavior, uh, things such as hand flapping, any sort of self-stimulatory behavior, head banging, as well as perseverative behavior, such as uh, staring at ceiling fans or lights, playing with the same toy over and over. I have some examples to show you. Every video I will show you today, I have explicit permission to show you. Go, Andrew. Go, go. Andrew. Let me see you dance. Let me see you dance. Come on. Go, Andrew. Go, 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 Andrew. Go, 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 Andrew. Go, 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 Andrew. Go, 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 Andrew. Go. Okay. Are you dancing in here, Andrew? <laughs> and <I'm> still spinning. <laughs> Still spinning, and that's what I want to point out here is that um, our friend here had been spinning on his little step stool, and uh, um, he was uh, um, uh, interrupted, and he had a brief social response, and then he went right back to uh, spinning. Here we see him again on the playground, and he's been on this playground for quite a long time, and he's having a grand all time. So kids with Down syndrome stim, okay? Uh, we know that uh, kids with Down syndrome will have self-stimulatory behavior and we have to call that out. Uh, in this study by Chanel et al, uh, they administered the social responsiveness scale uh, to patients who had only Down syndrome and specifically excluded those who had a dual diagnosis of autism. And they found that 60% of them had elevated mannerism scores. So were uh, engaging in some amount of, of, of stimming. So what is different about uh, a stereotypy in uh, children with a dual diagnosis? Well, they, they do it more and uh, they're harder to redirect. And so what we, uh, and these were studies that were done by Dr. Capone at George, Cop George Hopkins and his group. And they administered the aberrant behavioral checklist um, uh, to children with uh, Down syndrome, Down syndrome and autism and Down syndrome and uh, stereotypic movement disorder and what they found is that those children who had a diagnosis of autism had the highest stereotypy scores and in subsequent analysis they found that uh, this stereotype behavior was more complex, more odd, more bizarre. This is what I definitely see clinically. I uh, definitely see kids with Down syndrome who engage in just a little bit of simming here and there, uh, but they are easily redirected as soon as you offer them an opportunity to engage socially versus a child with autism who might need to stim too tolerate the engagement um, and, uh, and or will be perfectly entertained uh, by that self-stimulatory or stereotypical behavior. Another thing that was brought up was abnormal play, uh, such as uh, lining up toys, uh, different manner of play. Um, other things that I see clinically, uh, sorting uh, the toys instead of playing with them. Um, repeatedly just taking things out of containers and putting them back in and taking them out and putting them back in uh, in a way that is outside of what would be expected developmentally. Pretend play is often limited and I really inquire about this. I do see a little bit of better pretend play often in girls, but even then it has a stereotype and learned quality to it, especially if they've had uh, some amount of uh, behavior therapy. 
Uh, oftentimes what I do see is a manner of play with a toy that's the same over and over and over, as well as focusing on a part of a toy as opposed to a whole. A lot of my kids that when asked about what do they do with the doll, they really fixate on the nose or the eyes and they'll lick the nose or the eyes instead of engaging with the whole doll. Impaired social skills was brought up by parents uh, by almost half of our respondents. And this is interesting, right? Because what we know about kids with Down syndrome is that social skills are a strength. And I think that this is where a lot of kids with Down syndrome really fool us when they uh, are autistic because they might still greet you with this big old smile, but then this social interaction is not sustained. And uh, it really takes a lot more work for uh, me as the examiner to sustain that social interaction. Um, and there's clearly less imitation, less back and forth, as well as much less shared attention. One thing that I ask a lot is, how does your kid let you know about something interesting, like a puppy or a plane in the sky? Do they point, do they call your attention to it? And uh, many parents of a kid with a dual diagnosis will report that they're not doing that, that they might prefer to play by themselves than to play with other kids, even though they have that initial moment of, of, of social uh, and appearing social. And I would say that from personal experience, my patients with Down syndrome uh, look a lot more, uh, Down syndrome and autism look a lot more social than my patients with autism who do not have autism, who do not have Down syndrome, pardon me. This is another big one. Um, when we asked parents of kids with Down syndrome, what made you think that your kid was different from other kids with Down syndrome, a lot of the parents talked about communication impairment. And we know that kids with Down syndrome will have speech delays and communication impairment. So what we're talking about here is a communication impairment that is more significant than what would be expected in a child with Down syndrome alone. Um, studies have shown that uh, among kids with a dual diagnosis that are verbal, they do acquire language about six months later that they have poor, not only re expressive, but also receptive abilities. What I see a lot of the time in my patients is that they have quite good receptive abilities and they struggle to express themselves due to dysarthria, dyspraxia, uh, versus my kids with a dual diagnosis who may still have the dysarthria and apraxia, uh, but also the layer of autism uh, causing impairments in, in both receptive and expressive language abilities. Um, a lot more echolalia. Some of my kids that I have on the, with a dual diagnosis will be quite good at repeating things, but will not use those words spontaneously. And then in the older and more verbal kids, we, we see uh, pronoun reversal errors, uh, problems with social chat, uh, which are things that we see with autism. This is a video of someone with Down syndrome who does not have autism. And I just want to point out how this kid who has significant expressive language delays um, is showing us beautiful gestural um, and, uh, communication as well as beautiful uh, uh, shift in eye gaze and share attention. Plus the video is adorable. How, how do you say happy? Happy, good job. How do you say mad? <laughs> how do you say tired? How do you say crybaby? No, how do you say crybaby? Crybaby. Come on, say crybaby. Come on, say chillon. Crybaby. Baby first. hermano, how do you say brother? Sister? Ice cream? How do you say ice cream? <laughs> yeah, we emphasize the ice cream because he really likes the word ice cream. How do you say cracker? Cracker. How do you say chip? Waffle. Bread. Bread. Good job. So you saw a lot of shifting gaze. You saw a lot of the use of sign. This is, by the way, where I get on my soapbox and encourage everybody to encourage the use of uh, sign language in our patients because it makes it much easier to then evaluate for a co-occurring uh, diagnosis of autism if someone has been equipped uh, with a gestural form of communication. 
Um, sensory issues were reported by a lot of families. I see this a lot as well, including preferred, uh, preferring to be isolated in low sensory environments, refusing touch type activities, difficulties with loud noises, darkness, crowds, not wanting to be touched. Um, I also see this, I see a lot of sensory issues around feedings, um, as well as tantrums that are difficult to explain and difficult to soothe. Poor eye contact was also reported by families. This is another one um, where it's easy to get fooled. A lot of my patients with a dual diagnosis will look at me in the eye for a brief period of time. Um, the eye contact is often not sustained and usually not communicative in the way uh, that my uh, kids with Down syndrome without autism will really use their gaze to help, me, to help communicate. Um, many of my patients with a dual diagnosis will focus on my mouth instead of looking to my eyes or might give me a little side gaze. Um, a lot of parents noted an overall delayed achievement in developmental milestones that stood them apart from other kids with Down syndrome only. Um, I see this a lot in communication, as I mentioned, but also in a lot of self-help self skills, including a lot of uh, a lot greater delays in things like toilet training and self-feeding. And then a lot of parents reported mood and behavior issues, uh, including tantrums, hyperactivity, self-injury, anxiety. And we know that there are higher rates of hyperactivity and ADHD in people with Down syndrome and anxiety and other mental health conditions and people with Down syndrome, especially when they're older. Um, but when compared to uh, individuals with Down syndrome only, uh, we did see that there were much higher rates of ADHD and this pans out in the review of the literature and on the aberrant and behavior checklist, uh, anxious behavior, and some subscales on anxious behavior uh, significantly differentiated the kids with a dual diagnosis from those with Down syndrome only. And some kids with Down syndrome and autism present with a regression. Um, maybe a third, maybe less uh, present with regression. And what was noticeable about the findings of the literature review is that this regression tended to happen later uh, than when it happens for uh, children with idiopathic autism. Of course, if there's a regression as a medical provider first, I would want to rule out medical causes of regression, including new seizures, hypothyroidism, other systemic disease that would explain the regression. So my take homes, um, the concern from the parent might be my kid is different from other kids with Down syndrome and that concern should be honored. They tend to present around three to five years of age and uh, the families will often bring concerns to a pediatrician or an educator. And the symptoms that they're bringing up or the symptoms that you will see are gonna be symptoms of autism, uh, including stimming which can, and stereotypy, which can be more complex and harder to redirect than that of uh, kids with Down syndrome only. They may look social, but act less social and, or uh, overall have a less sustained social interaction. That the language delays are significant and more significant than what would be expected from individuals with Down syndrome only with a significant uh, difficulty with receptive language as well, as well as spontaneity in terms of the use of language, and there may be more co-occurring hyperactivity and anxiety. How do we evaluate? Disclaimer, there is no good evidence on this, and this is called out in the American Academy of Pediatric Guidelines. I start with the basics. So let's make sure the kid can hear. Let's make sure the kid can see. Let's make sure that we are checking the thyroid per the guidelines. Let's rule out any other co-occurring medical condition. Um, these are of course the, the basics of any sort of evaluation. A lot of assessment tools have been used in studies that look at Down syndrome and autism. They are listed here, and I know that my slides are in your syllabus. I wanna uh, uh, talk about a couple of studies. The MCHAT. The MCHAT is easy. It's freely available online. It's 20 questions. Uh, the revised version with follow-up is the one that we're currently using um, with the follow-up part that's available for any failed item. Um, and the MCHAT was found to be uh, uh, up to 80% sensitive in children with Down syndrome at 60 months of age or younger who were verbal or 72 months of age and younger for kids who were nonverbal uh, in the study by Di Giuseppe et al., although not very specific. Personally, as a primary care doctor and the caregiver for over 200 children with Down syndrome, I do routinely administer the MCHAT because 
questions, why not? Um, I will then use the MCHAT in conjunction with the, the rest of the clinical information as well as observation that I have in front of me. The social communication questionnaire can be quite helpful. It's a 40 item yes or no parent screener. It's intended for children of chronological age uh, over four years with a developmental age of, uh, of at least uh, over two years. Um, it was found to uh, have a high agreement uh, with the ADIR, the autism parent interview, um, and uh, uh, substantially unaffected by age, gender, language level, and performance IQ. Uh, different groups suggest different cutoff scores, which of course will impact uh, the sensitivity and specificity of any screener. Um, but again, the social qu uh, communication questionnaire can be quite a helpful tool um, in uh, identifying uh, kids uh, with a dual diagnosis. And then the aberrant behavior checklist that I have mentioned before, because there has been research on it and uh, research on how uh, kids with Down syndrome will differ from kids with Down syndrome and autism uh, with specific subscales like the irritability, lethargy, and stereotypy subscales uh, being perhaps most helpful based on data from Dr. Capone's group at Hopkins. Also, the aberrant behavior checklist is validated for use in people with intellectual disability, uh, unlike some of the other scales that are available. And then there's the ADOS, and the ADOS is not specifically validated in children with Down syndrome. Um, however, as someone who is trained to administer the ADOS and has administered it in children with Down syndrome and with a dual diagnosis, I actually do think that it's an incredibly uh, appropriate tool to use. One thing that I wanna call out that's not super scientific and I recognize it, but I think it's really interesting is when we looked at our survey responses and uh, what uh, the parents were reporting, we tried to uh, think about them and map them onto the ADOS scoring algorithm. The green boxes are boxes where our parents' answers overlap with uh, um, scoring uh, uh, parts of the ADOS, and the ones that are bolded are ones that count towards the final algorithm of determining if someone does or does not meet criteria for autism. And uh, I thought it was quite interesting that specifically the uh, answers that our parents gave us mapped up now nicely onto the ADOS uh, scoring algorithm. Um, my dream is to do this in a way that's a lot more scientific than an Excel spreadsheet with coloring and shaded boxes. Um, and I'm hoping to collaborate uh, with the UCSF Center for Autism and Neurodevelopmental Disabilities on this. What are our recommendations for assessment? Um, a parent interview I think is key um, and it should be based on uh, questions from the ADIR. Getting information from teachers about social interactions with peers is key and I do routinely reach out to schools as part of my evaluation process. I would consider the social communication questionnaire as well as the aberrant behavior checklist. A Vineland is gonna be useful and then the ADOS I would administer the ADOS and include it as part of the evaluation. Now you have identified someone with a dual diagnosis, how do you intervene to support them? Again, we do not have a lot of evidence on what works and doesn't work in kids with a dual diagnosis. So we go with what parents report as challenges for kids with their dual diagnosis, such as communication deficits, rigidity, impairment in social skills, mood and behavior issues. I think it's really important when we think about any intervention to first set goals with a long-term perspective. What do we want for this person's life? And then using that long-term perspective and goals to develop short-term objectives uh, that can guide therapy. Parents found that ABA was one of the most helpful interventions um, followed by other therapies. School was listed as a helpful intervention um, as well as parental support. I don't have time to show you this video, but I encourage you to Google it. And uh, it does show uh, what ABA might look like in someone with a dual diagnosis. Um, goals can be written to support any one area of difficulties, including communication and language, social skills, self-care and adaptive functioning, play, um, learning and academic skills. We are in the era of COVID and telehealth. Uh, this was a study done on individuals with autism, not Down syndrome and autism. And it looked at the effectiveness of a parent training um, uh, 
protocol, and it did show that parent training was effective in uh, um, uh, reducing disruptive behavior in children with autism only. So we are hoping that the same can be said of kids with a dual diagnosis. Supporting communication is super, super, super important. And over and over, I see supported commu uh, supporting communication having a huge impact on behavioral difficulties in my patients uh, uh, with a dual diagnosis. And it could be an unaided system like sign language or aided systems that can be low tech good, like good. PECS. Again, this is our friend and uh, he is using PECS to express his needs. I want my get a sauce good job and of bro. course he's saying something that he already knows how to say because of course we want to start by being really successful before we move on to challenging uh the child with someone that they can't yet say i want more Applesauce. And this is our friend demonstrating the use of a higher tech device. A word about school. We decided to ask our respondents, hey, was school helpful? And we want to reflect on how over a third of our survey participants said flat out, nope. Why might that be? Um, an uh, IEP needs to be truly individualized and the school setting needs to be truly individualized oftentimes to serve the need of someone with a dual diagnosis and not all uh, districts and not all IEPs that truly support the needs of a child with a dual diagnosis. Um, and so my take on point from this, and I know I don't have to tell this audience this, but uh, as providers, we can't assume that just because someone has an IEP, they're being appropriately served. Uh, teach is, a, uh, is an approach to school and teaching that can be very helpful um, with principles including influencing the physical structure um, of, le of the learning environment with specific layout of surroundings that minimizes distraction and increases focus. Um, uh, scheduling of each activity and work systems that make one feel that they've truly completed a task lots of routines and lots of visuals. We know that uh, uh, TEACH can help uh, with goal attainment in adults with uh, autism and intellectual disability compared to uh, standard of learning. And uh, um, uh, this can be applied for kids with Down syndrome and autism. Whenever we think about the outcome of any intervention, we have to take into account um, that any intervention will have different effectiveness based on how much of the intervention we're doing, um, how often we're doing it, how consistently we're doing it, and then what else is going on in someone's life. If someone is also having heart surgery next week, then maybe whatever intervention that we are doing is not gonna be as effective. If someone is accessing one of these interventions, but they've just been evicted, and there's a lot of other things going on, then again, it might not um, be as effective as someone who has a lot more uh, focus on, on the intervention at hand. And then, of course, there are some characteristics of the child that are going to make any one intervention more or less uh, successful. Medications do have a role in managing a child with a dual diagnosis. Uh, there are no studies specific to medications in individuals with Down syndrome and autism. Um, however, we do use uh, uh, literature available on uh, autism and medication use. And uh, we use a lot of the same medications um, that we use uh, uh, when treating uh, behavioral and uh, uh, mood difficulties uh, in individuals with autism. No medication undoes the core symptoms of autism. And uh, when we think about medications, I think it's important to set really clear goals. What are we working on? And then specific to people with Down syndrome, although this is my approach with everybody, start low, lower than you think, and go really slow. What I have seen in my patients is that uh, they often respond to much lower doses and they may get side effects at much lower doses than I would have otherwise expected. And so you have to see the patients often. And whenever possible, you will consult with a child psychiatrist or developmental and behavioral pediatrician. However, if they're not available in your area, then I do encourage people to familiarize themselves with um, uh, how to prescribe and dose specific medications so as to promptly uh, uh, address the needs of the patient. 
So as take home, how do we support children with a dual diagnosis? ABA may be helpful. Parent training may be helpful. School can help a lot and it needs to be structured. Definitely support communication. Refer to a Down syndrome clinic and I'll talk about that in just a minute and consider medication when appropriate. What about the family? One thing that I uh, was used to think about when I started doing this work is why? What's the point of adding an additional diagnosis? Isn't there enough? And the truth is that for a lot of families, they have been wondering for a long time, what is going on? Why is my kid different? Why isn't my kid progressing the way that other kids are? And that additional diagnosis explains a whole lot. Parents of kids with, with a dual diagnosis will tell you that autism is the primary disability. And so recognizing that primary disability and appropriately addressing it is life changing. However, we are layering an additional neurodevelopmental diagnosis uh, for, to, onto a family that already had an existing uh, diagnosis of Down syndrome. And oftentimes there's a period of adjustment and, grieve, and grieving, and that needs to be supported and respected as well. We asked our families, what was the greatest impact of raising a child with a dual diagnosis? And so many mentioned social isolation, uh, time demands to care for the child, a lot of stress. This is what I see clinically. Uh, outings can be difficult. The unpredictability of some behaviors can be difficult. But I also wanna call out that 38% um, of our families said, it made us a stronger and more empathetic family. So it's not all doom and gloom and uh, um, uh, families uh, uh, are able to really see uh, the beauty in um, having a family member with a dual diagnosis as well. I wanna call out some helpful support organizations. Of course, the Down Syndrome Connection of the Bay Area, an amazing organization that has specific supports for people with a dual diagnosis, including uh, consultation with an autism, um, uh, Down Syndrome Autism Specialist, um, as well as support with augmentative communication. And lately they've done a series of amazing webinars on the dual diagnosis. The Down Syndrome Autism Connection is a closed online support group um, that is national and does support uh, families of children with a dual diagnosis. There are books that are available to learn more uh, when Down Syndrome and Autism intersect, as well as a newer book, a new course, uh, Mother's Journey Navigating Down Syndrome and Autism um, by Teresa Anerstal, um, who is a, um, an author and also does the consults for the Down Syndrome Connection of the Bay Area. And then there are sections on the major uh, Down Syndrome websites uh, on the dual diagnosis. We at the Down Syndrome Clinic at uh, UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital Oakland are here to help. Myself as the physician and medical director, Mary Beth Finch as our infant development specialist and physical therapist, Leticia, our former social worker, and soon um, we will have a new social worker, and Annika Miller, our family liaison. We do have a website and uh, we are uh, always building it and adding resources. Under the development tab, you will find a whole subsection on autism that we hope you find helpful. And the site is www.charliesclinic.org. I want to acknowledge the work of the Down Syndrome Medical Interest Group. Uh, this is a group of health professionals committed to providing optimal care and wellness of individuals with Down Syndrome across the lifespan. Um, it, it is comprised of members from a number of different disciplines, many of whom work in uh, very specialized Down syndrome clinics. And, there, and uh, we put together some recommendations uh, for how to support um, uh, individuals with a dual diagnosis, starting with listen to the parents' concerns, um, understand that there may be an additional diagnosis, and do not fall into the trap of diagnostic overshadowing. I can't tell you how many times families have told us, they just told us this was Down syndrome evaluate instead, including doing thorough evaluations using a number of different screenings and further referrals. And advocate, advocate for your patients uh, with the educational system, with the insurance system to make sure that they get the appropriate therapies and the appropriate communication support, as well as uh, on higher levels uh, to make sure that there's adequate funding uh, for uh, research in this area. And join me in distributing information. If we're all talking about the dual diagnosis of Down syndrome and autism, that age gap between first concerns and time of diagnosis will continue to shrink as it should. 
Uh, you can become a member of DESMIG um, if you're a professional who cares for people with Down syndrome. And we do have a subgroup on uh, uh, Down syndrome and autism. And we're always welcoming new members uh, to join us in this work. I have a lot of references and I know there will be time for a question and answer at the end. My slides will be in your syllabus and thank you so much for having me today.